We are in the Palazzo of the Bianchi family, one of the most beautiful, unbelievable homes I've ever been in my life. The story that, that created this, a guy left San Gimignano, their great-grandfather, moved to Milan to get a job, then World War II happened, and then he set up a small embroidery shop, and it grew into one of the world's most famous embroidery houses through hard work, dedication. They did it from a small town kid from San Gimignano to owning a palazzo over the Duomo. It's an amazing story and I think extremely inspirational. I like this lifestyle, I'm into it. I've got burro y achuga, butter and anchovy, which I think, I think to many people sounds gross, but it's delicious. And then I've got an Aperol spritz with butter in it. Aperitivo time is something we should do more. The happy dance. It's delicious. Mm. It's really two bites, not one. Not her. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> We're rolling, Rob. There's a long history of winemaking in Tuscany, and I mean long, like 700 BC long. And it all begins with the Etruscans, a people who created the first major civilization of Tuscany. The term Toscana was given to them by the Romans, which meant heartland of the Etruski. And I, like most people who've come here, heart this land too. We've had a long, fantastic journey throughout Italy, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm a bit exhausted. So it was time for a little rejuvenation and fresh air. Turns out, I'm not the only one that looks to Tuscany for a bit of R&R. &R. You spend the majority of your time in Milan. When you come here, is it your recharge? Is this your battery? I, yes, it's... Uh, uh, Chianti Classico is uh, just uh, to recuperate energy, because uh, there is more green, there is uh, influence of the, the sea, uh, the, the atmosphere uh, is uh, more more strong than uh, in Chianti. This is a, a breathtaking, amazing place, and that the air, like from this morning when we were at Massa Marittima to, yes. to here, there's yes. always this breeze. There's yes. always this fresh air. I mean, like everything feels clear. I'm, I think I can take deeper breaths now sure. uh, than I have been the past <laughs> few weeks. Yes, yes, and uh, I think uh, the the people discover more and more this characteristic uh, of uh, Marimma, uh, also because it's a very authentic uh, land. It's not sophisticated, uh, it's authentic. I feel like, like you said, this, this doesn't just refill your batteries, it recharges you, and I think in gaming culture we call that level up, and uh, I think we're leveling up here in the Marimma. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. The idea behind Rocco de Frostinella was born over a lunch conversation between Paolo and Eric de Rothschild. Yes, that Rothschild. Their partnership reminds me of a contrast between preserving traditions and culture while allowing outside influence to grow and tell the continuing story of what Tuscany is. The modern building that holds Frasinello, designed by Renzo Pieno, is a wonder to behold. Inside is the most massive barrel room I've ever seen in collections of beautiful art, including a donation by renowned artist Dave LaChapelle that now dons the bottles and is part of the story of the winery. But the story of winemaking in this region began way before the now famous Super Tuscan winemakers moved into the Maremma. Paolo brought us to the Etruscan Center at the Museum di Maremma and introduced us to Luca Cappuccini, professor of Etruscan archaeology at the University of Florence, who showed us where it all began. When we were riding up in the car, we were told that there's been events at, at Rocco de Frasinello that, that replicate the music of the Etruscans, and we learned that there's, they're, they're working on a wine that replicates the wine of the Etruscans. Is there a written record of the Etruscan history that tells us what they did, what they played, what they drank, or if there's not, how, how are you figuring out what notes they played, what wine they drank? È molto, eh, sono tutti argomenti che in realtà hanno delle spiegazioni diverse. Eh, ad esempio la musica eh, si può ricostruire non la melodia, ma il suono, attraverso la ricostruzione degli oggetti tramite i reperti che sono stati trovati che appartengono a dei flauti o a degli altri strumenti. 
Per quanto riguarda invece il vino, noi ci basiamo sia su analisi chimiche effettuate all'interno dei contenitori che contenevano il vino, sia soprattutto le fonti anche latine e greche che ci parlano di come veniva diciamo bevuto questo vino sia da un punto di vista del rituale sia da un punto di vista della sua composizione cioè che veniva mischiato con l'acqua che venivano aggiunte altre sostanze quindi diciamo c'è un doppio lavoro un lavoro diciamo più scientifico la base sull'analisi e un lavoro più filologico legato appunto sulle eh, tradizioni letterarie noi purtroppo eh, di quella che era la letteratura etrusca le fonti scritte etrusche non abbiamo molto perché purtroppo tutta la letteratura etrusca si è persa nel tempo e non è stata copiata come invece sono stata copiata quella latina e quella greca quindi quello che fanno molti studi è quello di prendere la vite selvatica che c'è nei posti e capire se questa discende dalla vite antica. È possibile un, uh, assaggiare un uh, vini etruschi? Sì, a Rocca di Frassinello in cantina. Bravissimo! Questo è il mio secondo glass. So they've recreated Etruscan wine for us. We have flowers, pepper, honey and cheese. And in this clay glass, which is pretty awesome because they knew how to pour. This is a, a lot of wine that could fit in here. It's very floral, it's, it's different. The acidity is lower. The cheese that they put in here has lactic acid, which makes it a little creamier. I'm not used to having flowers in my wine. It's really cool to be a part of history, even if it's an approximation. Very interesting. Love the past. Super happy that we make wine like we do today. Immersing yourself in history is inevitable when you visit Italy. Throughout the country, small towns dot the landscape. One key thing you will notice is that all of these towns are built on top of hillsides. This was to fortify themselves against their various enemies. The stone that we find in the vineyards is the same stone used to construct fortifications that make these villages so unique. Castellina, one of the most picturesque Tuscan towns, is a great example of this. It is also strategically located between Florence and Siena, the two modern-day capitals of Chianti Classico, who nowadays get along, but that wasn't always the case. We are in Castellina and Chianti. One of the most interesting parts of the, the village is this medieval tunnel behind me. Yes. What is it called and what was it for? So that, that is uh, the so well-known uh, Via delle Volte. Siena and Florence in the Middle Age were two big enemies and they were fighting a lot and Castellina was actually one of the border towns and it was considered to be probably the most important outspot uh, among the two cities. They decided uh, to call Filippo Brunelleschi, who is uh, the architect uh, of uh, the Duomo in Florence, mm -hmm. and thanks to, the, to his help, uh, they were able uh, to build uh, this marvelous uh, passage, uh, which is actually a symbol uh, of uh, the very ancient war between Siena and Florence. So as a person from Castellina, yeah and being part of Florence, the Flor mm -hmm. Firenze yeah. Comune. How do you feel about Sienese? So, yeah. I mean, uh, if you think today Castellina belongs uh, to the Siena province, uh, and so I think that uh, the funny things to be a Castellinese is that uh, you have in your blood both of uh, the origins, uh, some of the Sienese origins and some of the Florentine origins, uh, and that makes people from Castellina and Chianti just perfect. So, Cosimo, <laughs> your, 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 your name is Medici. Exactly. Yeah. So, how My do you My mother feel? is from Florence, so uh, I have to disagree with Alessia. I'm sorry. Uh, here, culturally, I think we are most Florence-oriented. Well, let's Even go check the way on. for talking and so on. So, yeah, let's go for check. Let's go check yeah. it out. <laughs> Although the tunnels were made during medieval times, they came in handy once again during World War II, when these small offshoots shielded the townspeople from the fighting. The Glastro rock found throughout Tuscany plays a major role in the vineyards as well. The Gagliole winery has stone walls, and not just any type of wall, that are protected by UNESCO, which means that when they're in need of a little repair, it has to be done using ancient techniques, which my back found out the hard way. <laughs> oh, oh. Guarda la corda. 
So he's telling me I didn't put it in straight line with the with the cord. These stones are the same stones we saw in the tunnels in yes. the castle. So yes. this is what they were using a thousand years ago yep. to build it. Yeah. And they've been doing this ever since. And this technique of not using cement, it seems dangerous that nothing's stuck together, but is, is it also by law that they have to do it the old this way? This is also by law, and uh, this is also one of the reasons why this technique uh, some months ago was uh, a word has uh, a heritage of UNESCO. So the work that they yes. do is UNESCO heritage yes. certified. Yes. That's incredible. That's am Imagine how many jobs there are like that. I'm UNESCO. <laughs> you are UNESCO. Not a place. No. These hands. Yeah, we are. Thank you, UNESCO. That's, it's amazing. I mean, the Galilei estate is as old as the rocks that help shape its landscape. The earliest mention of the winery dates back to 994 AD in records found in Siena, which stated that King Berigarius' son bequeathed this estate to his wife. That must have been nice. It's this story and the sprawling countryside that charmed Monica and Thomas Barr, the current Swiss owners of Galilei, who applied their passion for this area into reviving the winery. Changes like this in Chianti have become more commonplace as foreigners fall in love with all the richness Tuscany has to offer. It has both helped the region thrive, but also solidified its roots. Those who come from the outside are not here to change the region, but preserve it. And a recent system was put in place to further help uphold the culture and history without damaging the land by overplanting vines. Chianti Classico is what we would say is like tapped out. You can't plant anymore, but you've got this interesting system of credits. I don't understand it at all. It sounds like derivative tradings, 2008. It's like Wolf of Chianti Clats, Wolf of Castellina, mm -hmm. sitting up there. I, can you like explain it to me? Uh, let's say the Chianti Classico have decided to reach the limit of hectare uh, planted with vines. Uh, and I was telling uh, before that it's really important to maintain the biodiversity because we are not just in a wine region. So if you go around, you don't see just vineyards, you see olive trees, you see other cultures, you see vineyards, you see many, many things. And this is biodiversity, this is a, a richness for us, a richness for all the environment. So it's really important. Now uh, we, we set this limit and now if you want to plant another hectare, you have to buy this some sort of credits from other wineries. So if you are going to dismiss a, a vineyard, I'm going to buy the credits of the vineyard you are dismissing and I'm going to plant another vineyard. What happens to that land that was formerly a vineyard? You can plant something else, not vineyard. But you, you, you can, you can, trees or grass sure, yeah. or something. Yeah. Absolutely. It can't be vines. Yeah. We were talking today on the, on the drive here, we were like, it's so pretty here and if this were the United States, it would be bulldozed, there would be only vineyards and high-rise hotels. Yeah. I, I think this is very smart from us, from the people that have decided this. I mean, you can't just say, okay, here the wine is good, let's plant vineyard. Boom, vineyards all over the, the place. It's not right. I mean, it's not just about the wine. You've got a lot of foreign investment here. Are you mm -hmm. able to maintain your cultural identity? Yes. By, by preventing some development? That's for sure. That's for sure. If you think about our owners, they came from Switzerland in 1919. They came here to both a beautiful property as Galilee is, and their most important goal was to maintain the beauty of the property as it was in the very ancient past. And so I think that uh, things like that uh, has to continue to be running this way in Italy just to preserve the beauty of our country and just to preserve the tradition and the culture of the country. Cheers to everybody. Salute. It's hard to simplify what it is I love about this region. Maybe it's the rich history, the incredible food and wine, hashtag obvi. But what it is most known for is its countryside. Olive trees and vineyards intertwine and complement each other like siblings. Their symbiotic relationship flourishes in the warm and fresh climate found in the hills of Tuscany. In the business of winemaking, Mother Nature always has the last word. For Barbara Vidmer of Bronchaya, she feels her role is simply to help the vines along as they find their natural way. So good morning. Good morning. Thank you for meeting us. This is the first time I've ever seen a sunrise in Chianti Classico. What is your normal morning routine in the vineyards? Well, uh, morning is the first time just to go into the vineyards to check what's going on and, and, and what we have to do outside if there, if there are special issues. And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's a good start to see uh, where we are and what we have to do. Do you plan 
a few days out for what you're gonna do? Or is it basically like you wake up, you see what the weather is and you're like, okay, we have to do this today. Well, as, as everything in, 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 uh, in a wine estate, you try to plan and then you adapt. Nature is, is uh, the most important thing, but also a uh, beautiful thing, but also the most challenging thing. So plans are important, having a project is important, having ideas, but uh, there are a lot of situations you just have to change again. And how, you know, growing up in Switzerland, and we think Swiss people being very precise, how, how do you adapt or did you have to adapt to the idea of just going with the flow? Uh, actually, it's something I like a lot. For me, and this is not regarding only the vineyards, but also the cellar, winemaking on top level is a lot of philosophy, not, not science. So a lot of things you try to be precise, but uh, it's much more stomach and heart decision. And uh, the idea of learning each year something new and knowing exactly that it is not only my hand, but in nature, it's something I love. I may have not been used to watching the sunrise, but fortunately for me, the early morning paid off because I got to walk in the vineyards that supply the fruit of Il Blue, the wine that first introduced me to the term Super Tuscan. Il Blue is Barbara's Merlot-based Super Tuscan that showcases how grapes, not traditionally from Tuscany, can produce a wine that is distinctly different from tradition, but still, in its own way, very Italian. Contrary to popular belief, Super Tuscans do not have to be Bordeaux varietals. Traditional Italian wine regions have very specific rules that detail what grapes can and must be used. For example, to be called Chianti Classico, you must have at least 80% of Sangiovese in the blend. But in the late 1960s, inner Super Tuscans, they're the rebels, the pioneers, the Lone Ranger cowboys, not wanting to be hemmed in by rules or traditions. They just want to make delicious wines that just didn't follow the rules. Some were all Sangiovese, and some included Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, even Syrah. But just like everything in life, it's all about balance. Balance creates complexity, and it's something that Barbara has mastered over the years to create her signature blend. So we thought we'd try it in 90 seconds. Il Blue is a blend, and we've it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Sangiovese. These are all 2018. These are all from the Berricaia. We set up a little competition. We're gonna each blend, see if we can get our own Il Blue going, and then Barbara's gonna judge and decide that I'm the winner. Um, <laughs> okay. We have 90 that. seconds. Welcome to the Thunderdome. <laughs> Okay, well. Jesse, you're up first. I can't give you the exact breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much disappointed about that. <laughs> but what I can tell you, Barbara, is that this is a primary blend of Merlot, the Sangiovese, for acidity and brightness, and then just for color and, and that outer structure, I added a very small amount of Cabernet Sauvignon. I was thinking Merlot, but then when I tasted the Cabernet and the Sangiovese, they seemed to complement each other so nicely. When you added the Merlot, it, it seemed to give it good depth. So I, I felt like it's, this is a smooth, kind of supple blend. Hope you yeah. enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So this is about 50% Cabernet Sauvignon, 50% Sangiovese, and 30% Merlot. I know that doesn't add up to 100, uh, but I wasn't paying attention. I was not paying attention to what I put in. I was just doing it by my mouth. So it's 108, wait, 50, 50. It's 130% wine. Okay. <laughs> it's really tough to choose one of them. You have to. I have to. We have to shit talk each other in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, honestly, the first one is very much what we are doing and of course what we believe uh, is, is what we want to achieve. So my personal uh, plan is very similar to chess ones, but uh, I think all of you did a great job and all three wines are very nice. So Jesse wins. <laughs> Good job, Jesse. Good job, Jesse. Well, I tried, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, Working with these wines for many of years, having the idea of what they should taste like, and then just having my small thumbprint. So, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I just puked in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
Jesse, congratulations for winning. You get to go to Tuscany. <laughs> As with everything, trends and fads move markets. There are people that chase those trends and others that bucket. To those that stick to tradition, it can be difficult to be out of fashion for the moment, but sticking to one's passion in the world of wine has paid off. Across the globe, wine lovers seek to have a wine that is unique to its place, to its native grapes, and to feel a special connection that only can come from a specific place. Inter Fabrizio Bianchi, a textile merchant who began Castel de Monsanto in the early 1960s to uphold the values of tradition and classic Tuscan wine with a little touch of forward thinking. He made the first single vineyard designated Chianti Classico in 1962 and began saving bottles of each vintage to age in his cellars, a rarity at the time. People called him crazy, but he had an inkling that what he was doing would pay off. He never wavered in the idea that Chianti Classico is to be Sangiovese and a kiss of other native grapes, even when it was not popular. And he was right. Laura Bianchi, Fabrizio's daughter who now runs the estate, continues to find success in transforming her dad's combination of revolution and tradition. Talk to us about this continuous thread of not changing, always sticking to the I identity of this place because a lot of people don't do that and they kind of vacillate with trend. What's the journey and the story of, of not changing from being a traditional producer? I think that when my father arrived here, he was a, a revolutionary man. In 1962, he created the first uh, uh, single vineyard Chianti Classico. You need to imagine what was the area in the 60s, much different than now. So Il Poggio is recognized as the first uh, single vineyard ever made inside the denomination. So for sure, he was a, a revolutionary man for, for the denomination. We, we have always been so convinced of what has been done in the past that we needed to protect uh, uh, this patrimony. Tuscany probably was more known for international varietal, uh, super Tuscan. Uh, we decided, very much convinced, uh, to keep the tradition uh, of all what good has been done in the past. Honestly, we suffer, suffered because the style of our wines in the 90s were completely different than what probably most of the market asked at that time. Uh, but this gave us the strength to, uh, to be recognized as uh, classic. When I arrived at the winery, I respected all what my father did. I tried to give as much value as possible of uh, what has been made. And of course, improve in, in terms of details, quality, and, uh, but respect the, the tradition. The Bianchi family is known for staying the course to preserve their craft while everyone else in Italy was progressing forward using new technologies in every market. For wine, it was focusing on Sangiovese and keeping back vintages to show the incredible complexity instead of making super Tuscans. That same approach has been used in the family's textile business, founded by grandfather Aldo just after World War II. Not only have the Bianchis been making incredible Chianti Classico for 50 years, they've been making fabrics for very, very high-end designers to dress very, very famous people. You've heard of Armani and Beyonce, right? Our family have a business textile it started 71 years ago and start my grandfather Aldo and continue with my father Fabrizio that then decide to come to make wine and the winery and then to continue the tradition of the family I decide to remain a textile and we produce uh, uh, very special fabrics uh, for uh, uh, the most important designer uh, in the world. It's a special uh, work uh, because uh, normally in Italy uh, all uh, it's made uh, by machine. We have a part made by the machine and uh, a lot of parts is made by, uh, by hand. And all production is made uh, in the factory and not uh, in uh, outside. So to start to the yarn, to the study of the design, it's a very exclusive and very close uh, process of production. You make it as 
It is awe-inspiring to see how the Bianchi sisters follow their passions, not compromising quality or integrity in what they do. Maybe that means doing things a little old school, but it's this drive that has kept the family successful for so long. And it's these principles that they now hope to pass on to the future generation to preserve their past while moving steadily into the future. Well, I think I'm, I'm very fortunate right, to sit between two sisters who are maintaining the tradition of made in Italy. You with fashion, you with wine, two kind of iconic pieces that I think are what we as Americans love about Italy. Fashion, lifestyle, which are combined. Um, how do you feel about this, this the, the future of what you were both doing and your children working with you or hopefully working with you? <laughs> I think it's an incredible patrimony. It's uh, such a richness to keep the tradition of Italian lifestyle. It could be food, it could be wine, it could be fashion. Uh, we need to protect this patrimony. We are small, we are nothing, but we need to protect all what Italy has created through the genius of many people, and we need to protect it. I think that in Italy uh, there are a lot of uh, artists, a lot of people that uh, can teach uh, and, uh, and do many things. And it's very important for us to teach to our, our children. Uh, they need to learn that the job is very important, but the passion is more important. All that the family and the old family give us, and we hope that we give to them. Yeah, we hope to be able to <laughs> pass this passion this to yeah. our children. Well, the passing the passion. <laughs> passion. <laughs> Salute, grazie mille. Thank you very much for this tour. This is a, this is a, this this is your original cellar. Seventeen, you said seventeen forty. Seventeen forty, and everything started here. The first vinification, the first aging was in this part of the castle. So much history here. This is your legacy yeah. and your future. For sure. That's awesome. Is your back pocket big enough to take one? Uh, I'm kidding. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have a bottle detector at the gate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the dog. Yes. <laughs> she smells wine better yeah, than anything else. <laughs> She'll smell you out. <laughs> <laughs>